Okay, I'm here. Can you hear me, Gary? Can you hear me, Gary? You can hear me? Alright folks, hello everybody. There we go. There's Natalie. That S is Vana. Hi Vana. Can we hear Vana? <laughs> so um somebody drove their car into a transformer and knocked out Vana's um uh, internet <laughs> so she's just as she was getting ready to, to join us so uh she's sorting that out we had her on there um bye you there <laughs> never dull never dull thanks to everybody for joining us um here i'm just going to take bonna right off the picture here and um we'll get her sooner or later she'll show up Vanna, unmute or do something. I don't know. All right, so welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the uh, the gold work thing. This is going to be a fun experiment on so many fronts. And Natalie has a new microphone. Experiment. Yep. <laughs> we'll see. Matt, Natalie has a new microphone, so she's sounding good. Um, there it is. <laughs> a big old Yeti. Those things are the best. And then I uh, forgot to compliment uh, Flowers in the Background by Natalie there. Mm-hmm. Friday night. Courtesy of my garden. There we go. They were there Friday, and they made it all the way to Sunday, so we like that. Um, adding a little class to the joint. I got the usual stuff behind me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> poor Vana. I don't know. <laughs> we'll get her in here. She'll chime in at some point. We'll get her. Um, so, all right, we're going to, we're gonna, uh, as we've said a billion times here in the last two months, we're just going to go through. We've got I've got a whole array of gold work things laid out, and uh, Natalie's going to guide us in terms of of what they are, and we'll do a little couching so we can experience the different ways to couch uh, these things down and uh, experience behavior. And I have my um, I have my special uh, uh, gold work scissors that have a, a real fine serration on the blade. So it grabs the metal when you cut. And no, I'm not using my new new uh, Dovo. No, those aren't getting used for metal. So these are designed for that. And uh, I have my Melor. Is that we say it? how we say it? Melor? Yep. yep. Melor. Right there. Good. Right there. I have that. I don't know if we'll use it today, but I'm really proud of it. So there you have it. And I have a whole bunch of needles threaded up with wax thread. Um, I'm go oh, uh, I'm going to use black thread in the couching effort so you'll have an easier time seeing it. Uh, I think in, in many instances you would not use black thread for a lot of these things unless you were going for some art look. Uh, but I'm using black uh, so it's on a, a light cream cloth with the gold so it'll stand out so you'll see where it's going and where it's not going. Um, so just that. D don't always use black thread. No. All right, Natalie. Um, okay. Um, have at it. Tell me, th tell me things. Okay, Gary. So let's just begin with the simple couching stitch. I'm going to switch my camera over to my uh, embroidery, and maybe you can do the same, and then I'm people can see us working there. Yep. <clears throat> so you should have... Just, just a minute here, Natalie. Our, 
<laughs> Just a minute, Natalie. Whoa. Yep. Uh, hang on, my camera quit working. Hang on. hear me here Vanna you can hear me I can hear you yes all right there's Natalie yes Vanna hi Vanna I'm sorry it's all right <laughs> been a little crazy uh, for some reason I'm not getting my camera it was working just a minute bear bear with us folks hang on I'll gun it Well, Gary, while you're sorting that out, let me just chat about the some okay. old threads, okay? Yep. So the first threads that Gary's going to pull out and have a try with is a passing thread and a Japanese thread. And they look very similar, okay? A passing thread has a metal content, though, and a Japanese thread does not. Both of them have a fiber core. So if I unwound the wrapper of this Japanese thread, you'll see that there's a yellow, in this case, there's a yellow fiber core, and sometimes it's orange on some of the older threads. There you go, can you see that? So this is like a, a gold foil paper that's been wrapped around a fiber core. Sometimes it's silk, and often enough though, it's a, a synthetic fiber core. Okay, so if I bend this thread, it doesn't really stay in its place. Just pops back open again. Now, on the other hand, if I took a passing thread, for example, this silver that I have on the go right now, I can unwind it just like I did the Japanese thread. And you see the fiber core. But this actually has some metal content in it. So if I bend it in half, give it a little pinch, it actually stays there. So um, that's an important difference. And because this has a metal content, it's at risk of tarnishing. So any thread that is gilt or silver plated, it will tarnish. So that thread is typically held onto the surface of the fabric with a couching stitch <clears throat> because the thread, the metal thread or the Japanese thread, it's fragile. And if you sew it through the fabric, it will easily come unraveled. It, it can be done, um, but typically it's held on the front. In uh, some Elizabethan stitches, they're using passing thread through the fabric but uh, if you try that with Japanese thread, uh, it would most likely come unraveled quickly. So, Gary, shall I demonstrate the couching stitch? Uh, sure. And, and my camera's back up. So, whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah, do it however you Super. want. All right. So, if you want to get out your thread, Gary, when you're ready, you're just going to lay it across your fabric. Okay. And I'm I getting out my, my Japanese thread. You can use your Japanese thread or your passing. You're going to treat them the same way. All right. Um, and you're just going to lay it on the top of your fabric. You can use a single strand of it or you can use a double strand. Traditionally, it's couched as a pair. Okay. All right. So then uh, now I was just about to lop off a piece from this uh, length that you sent me. So then uh, okay. if I was going to do it as a pair, yeah. then... Um, just cut off a longer There's piece a, and work with them as a pair. Yeah, you could cut off a longer piece and fold it in half. Okay. Or you could cut off you could cut off two lengths of say, well, we're just just for demonstration, you know, a, a half, half a foot and put them side by side. It, it doesn't matter. So I'm not going to talk to you about how to uh, attach the ends and turn the corners today because we have a right. lot of threads to just basically discuss. I just want to show you how to attach it to the fabric. Yes. And okay. uh, that with the couching stitch. All right. So the couching stitch looks like, let's see, I'll do it over here. Am I still on the camera? Yeah, you're still Can on I the camera, yeah. Okay. So let's say I'm going to go over here. 
you come up on one side of, of the thread and I actually brought my needle out on a bit of an angle from right underneath. And then I'm going to reinsert my needle on a slight angle over top of my metal thread. There we go, I just caught it. Now some people, they like to use a laying tool when they're doing this stitch to help prevent their thread from getting into a knot. Mm -hmm. And depending what kind of thread you're using, if you're using a silk, for example, you might want to use a laying tool. Um, oops, it's caught again. You might want to use a laying tool to spread out the fibers of your thread. But in this case, I'm just using a single strand of Guterman. And I have waxed it before I've begun stitching because it just helps to calm down the little fluffy fibers that you can get on your thread. And it also strengthens the thread. If you're going to create, you know, a masterpiece that you want to pass down to your family, you want that thread to last for a long time. Mm -hmm. So that's the basics of the couching stitch. Let's have a, let's have a look at what you're up to with it, Gary. Well, I would really like to do that, Natalie, but I am getting zero cooperation from the camera. Oh, oh well, you might be off the hook, and I might have to do the show and tell today. That might be the case. No, I don't understand here. Hmm. Well, go, go ahead. I'm going to put you on full screen until I get this sorted out. So, um, okay. Uh, have at All right. it. Okay. So, I um, just to summarize, we've talked about Japanese thread and passing thread. And, of course, the two of them come in many different sizes. And you can also get them in different colors. You know, the traditional colors would be gold, silver, copper. But they exist in many colors as well. And you can get them quite large. For example, here's a large Japanese thread that I've shown before. This is like a quite a thick and heavy hank. And it's gorgeous. Um, Oops. You know, the... So these threads are typically held on to the surface of the fabric with a simple couching stitch. And for those of you who might need a reminder of the angle, do I get, Gary, are you able to zoom out or is that? Oh, I can uh, zoom out, yes. Mm -hmm. well, that's, I'm zoomed out as far as I can. But I can, okay. see every, I can see everything there. All right. So you can see here's my, my gold thread here. And you insert your needle on an angle. And you come back out on an angle as well. Okay, that just helps to hold your thread nice and snug onto the fabric. So the next type of thread that I wanted to have Gary explore is called twist. And there's lots of different kinds of twists. It also comes in lots of colors, lots of sizes. So I'll show you, this is would be a gilt twist, size number one. So a twist is typically made up of a three ply of some metal threads. So let me just slowly unwind that for you. And you can see that it's made up of three individual threads. You could probably even pry it apart here like that. Okay, you can see that there. So that would be your kind of typical twist. There are other twists that only have a two ply, like Elizabethan twist, um, and some Gresham twists as well. This is an example of a, a Gresham twist. Take the tape off here and this one is a two ply but they they have different finishes on them so it's really a beautiful beautiful thread and so this size is called baby because it's the smallest one i believe this is the smallest one you can see i just unwound them and that's what that looks like so this you can imagine is held onto the surface of the fabric with a couching stitch and there's a couple of ways you can approach the couching stitch with a, this type of twist, a two ply or a three ply. Let me give you an example. 
Okay, I'm back in business now. Oh, great. It better work. So do you want to ca catch up to me with the twist, Gary? All right, I will catch up with, to, with the twist here, yes. And so, while okay. he's catching up, can we go ahead and have, there's a, been a couple of questions, Natalie. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, Kathy Mountain was told in gold and silver work class from a Royal School of Needle Art uh, that instructor that the Elizabethans loved to couch because they reuse threads and bangles, et cetera. Plus it's so easy and fast. Do you agree with this? I think, I think couching it, once you just get a bit familiar with the mechanics, you can cover quite a lot of fabric. Um, right. Couching is very easy, very versatile, and it allows you to use so many different types of fibers on the fabric without having to worry about, damaging them as you sew if you tried to sew them through the fabric but as i said with a you know a thin passing can go through the fabric as well okay and then um josie matthias asked what type of thread that you were couching with and i thought it was silk and i said silk is that true or false no right now i'm just demonstrating as the holding thread it's a, a dark gray guterman cotton oh, thread okay no That's... actually it's a polyester guterman polyester yeah i just bought uh with Natalie's instruction, just a bunch of spools of regular Guterman sewing thread. Yep. Nothing fancy. Yeah. That's what I'm using, too. Yeah. So, um, yep, but often enough, you can couch with silk, you can, with cotton, you can couch with another metallic thread that's a very, very fine metallic thread. Um, if you're doing underside couching, you would want to use a linen thread because that's what was used back in the day when people actually did underside couching. Um, but today it's this a polyester kind of sew all thread from Guterman. And that's called the holding thread. The thread that you use to hold the metallic thread in place is, is your holding thread. So, um, Gary, back yes. to the, the twist here. Um, just make sure I'm on camera. Yeah, I am. Um, you, you can see that there's an angle to the twist, right? Yes. I'm going to go with the bigger twist because it would be easier for people to see. Okay. Whoops. Might help if I put a knot on the end of my thread. <laughs> so this is the Grecian, or how do you say it? I think you can say Grecian twist. Okay. Grecian, Grecian. Grecian, Grecian, okay. Um, so I come up on one side, and earlier I demonstrated that you want your couching stitch to come directly over top you know, at a 90 degree angle to your passing or your Japanese thread. But in this case, you can go on an angle so that your couching stitch would disappear into the groove of the twist. Now, in this case, it's not going to disappear because I'm using a dark gray thread. But um, normally for couching this type of twist, I would use... Uh, a self-colored thread, so a gold or a translucent thread. But for today's purposes, I'm showing you with a dark gray. So you can see my stitch is on an angle there, and it's holding the twist in place. But there's another kind of more sneaky way. I don't usually do this way because I find it tedious. But the, the other way is that you can ever so slightly untwist the thread Oops. and you can have your needle come up through the twists underneath so you see I just untwist it a little bit and then I'm going to catch so you come up right right in the middle of the thread yeah, but I untwist it a little bit so it helps me not nick the thread. Okay. Sit back, and then there's actually no couching stitch over top. The stitch is kind of hidden underneath. Oh, so when it and, twists back, then it just hides it. Yeah, I mean, right now you can kind of see it. It's right here. Yeah. And if I had used a self-colored thread, you wouldn't be able to see that. Compare that to this stitch where I've gone over the twist. Uh, on an angle, but as I said, if you were using a translucent or a self-colored thread, you you would hardly notice it. Right. So that that's kind of two ways that you could hold down a twist. So we talked about two ply twists, 
which would be, this would be an example. Or we talked about three ply twists, and this is a very small one, but they come smaller. <laughs> this is a three ply. It's called number one twist. Do you want to have a go, Gary? I do. I'm very excited to have a go. Okay. I'm so. watching. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. First, I got to add my camera back, though. While he's adding his camera back, we've had another question. All right. uh, Lindy Overton wants to know, how do you decide how frequently to put down the holding thread? And it looks like you have offset the holding thread when you are putting more than two rows of the passing thread. Good questions. So typically I don't, actually that's a long answer. <laughs> so um, typically if you just want to hold the fabric onto sorry, the uh, metal thread onto the fabric, you want to space it kind of no more than every four millimeters because if your spaces are too wide apart, the metal thread is going to move around. It's not going to stay where you want it to stay. Um, you can place it closer as well. There's some projects I do every single millimeter uh, depending on, you know, the shape that I'm making. Um, when you're going around a curve, for example, you might space them a bit closer to help it, help it hold its shape. And indeed, when you have multiple rows, typically you offset your holding thread, the couching stitch in a brick pattern. Now, of course, there are all kinds of fancy patterns that you can do. There's diaper patterns, there's pattern couching. Um, so that's beyond the scope of today. Today, I just wanted to show you how to get it onto the fabric, what the names of the thread and, and uh, how to hold them onto the fabric. Um, but those are two good questions. And this type of thing would certainly be covered at length in an introduction to embroidery class because those are kind of the, the core of it, spacing how and how frequently. Okay, now Natalie, I had this issue the other day when we were practicing for this show. Okay. okay. So, and, and it is how to literally get started because do you uh, come up with the thread and then place the passing thread, in this case the twist, next yeah. to where I came up and then go down to anchor it? I, I feel like I'm chasing a moving target here. Okay, so I don't know if you've noticed, maybe I was a bit cheeky in my demonstration. I did not start at the very tip of my thread. Um, I find it quite difficult to start with the, just the very tip of my thread. I start a little bit in. I do my couching stitch there. Um, and every once in a while, if I don't, if I want to make sure that my holding thread is going to stay in place, I might do a, a little pinhead stitch hidden underneath where I know my metal thread is going to go later on. And then I'll go back and do a, the couching stitch at the very beginning. Because if you do your couching stitch right at the start of your thread, it's going to move around. And anyhow, in the case of twist passing Japanese thread, you need to leave a tail that you can sink into the back of your fabric at a later point. Because if you left the tail on the front of your fabric, it's going to unravel on you. Okay. So Did I, I need answer to, your question? Yeah, so I need to plan a little extra. So I, I put one, one stitch in, and so now I'm going to come up again on the next twist. And this is where, see, this is where it's throwing me off, because when I come up with the next one, then the first one wants to loosen up. Right. So if you're finding that that's happening, you can, like I mentioned, you can do a little pinhead stitch just kind of underneath the twist, somewhere will be hidden, and carry on. You could also try pulling a little bit tighter, but you don't want to pull so tight that you're going to dent your uh, metal threads, right. unless that's an effect you're going for, of course. Well, what are the odds that I would come up in the very hole I went down? That takes some talent. I'm pretty impressed with myself <laughs> here. I mean, there's no way that that happens, except for what I'm trying usually, to do. Not usually, but this. there is a, a technique, of, a couching technique, where you want that to happen every Jeez. single time. That's I'm, hard. I made a mess here. Well, all right, that's going to anchor my thread there. All right, I'm just going to hold that right there. And of course, in my defense, I'm reaching around and under. Three different things but all right so i'm gonna come up come up on one side 
like so. And then I'm going to follow that spiral. Yep. And then kind of tuck it back back in underneath on a, on a slight angle as well. And that'll help hold your, your twist in place. Okay, there. Now I got that, I got that to follow the spiral. I'm pretty proud right. of that. Okay, Good. that's one. I win. One. I mean, I mean <laughs> so you've been doing this for two minutes, Gary. Give yourself a pat on the back. Okay. First, you have to get familiar with how does this thread function? How does it move? What's the weight of it? Well, and that's, yeah, that's the stuff that I'm adjusting to here. All right, so I'm going to try again. And so I always want to be working at tucking it underneath. So basically uh, following a straight line underneath the passing thread then. There we go. Uh, the twist, yeah. Or the twist, yes. There, I got yeah. two. I got two that pretty much follow the, follow the spiral. So you would just carry on doing that? Well, by golly, let me just do that. Oh, here, and, I you see... Know, it Oh, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> I mean, some people really like to work with twists and have their couching stitch on an angle because, um, I mean, when you're doing a couching stitch over a Japanese thread or passing, it really needs to be at a 90 degree angle. And some people, they struggle with that or it takes them a quite a long time to get used to that. And it's okay. We'll get there. The, the feel of the thread, it's quite textured. Yeah. Um, it, it's bumpy. It's rough. Uh, compared to the other two we were showing earlier, the, the passing thread, that's this one here, and the Japanese thread, that's this one here, um, it's much rougher than those two. Yeah. Okay, Vonnie, you know, all right, you right, Von, 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 you've actually done some of this on that basket thing you're doing. Did you have these yes. same issues? No. Of course not. I, I, we, I, I, my thread was like the thread that Natalie showed in the beginning. So a cotton core with the metal wrapped around it. My problems were, and she already kind of helped me because she said you don't start at the end. So I did and had that problem. But I would like to know, Natalie, how do you keep it from, um, I had a problem with the, the twist of metal braid on the core, like gaping or spacing as I worked with it. How do you get around that? Right. I mean, so this is when you get to be the boss, right? You can manhandle that twist and you can give it some over twist as you're working with it. So just before you place your couching stitch, twist it some more, okay. you know, you're the boss of the thread and you tell it what to do. Right? Okay. Um, so you probably just needed to give it some over twist there. And uh, once you've got your couching stitch, it will stay twisted. I think that answers your question, Vana. Yeah, it does. It seems like what I was working with was just, uh, just kind of, it was just unraveled a lot. And okay. um, it was just hard to, it was hard to work with. And I struggled with it the whole time I was doing the couching. The couching itself, I had no issues with. And my couching was done in a, in a pattern, not like what, and they wanted to see, and it was silk. That's why I said, oh, it's probably silk because I couched with silk and it was to be a pattern. Right. So, um, and then when you were using silk, you probably did not use beeswax because if you no. use beeswax over silk, then you, uh, you know, defy the purpose of, of, of using this silk, you take away the shine. Mm -hmm. Um, and my guess is that the thread you were using was a Japanese thread because these really easily, the paper unravels quite easily. Like you could see if I, yeah, it did just like if I do doing. this, it yeah. kind of opens up like that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. when you're turning around the corners, the paper kind of comes off. So this is one of the reasons I much prefer to use, um, a, a passing thread because you don't see that nearly as much. You can hardly see hardly see the wrap actually mm -hmm. um but the thing is at least the japanese thread for sure is going to stay nice and gold for you because um for the most cases we're buying synthetic 
So um, it's not going to tarnish. It's going to stay brilliant for you. Okay. So we've had a couple questions here. Uh, Mary Dorder has asked this twice, and I answered Rainbow Gallery has metallic serrated scissors. What do you suggest? Okay. I mean, there's two places that I buy them from. Um, Sarah Humphrey in the UK has them in her shop and Tanya Berlin also has serrated scissors. And I'm sure there are other places that just, those are the, the two I know off the top of my head and they're mm -hmm. quite nice. The, the serrated ones because they give you, they kind of grip the metal as you're cutting it and, and help you have a nice clean cut. Mm hmm. So yeah. um, Gary's going to use them a little bit to cut some metal threads and you'll see the nice cut that they make. And the serrated edge, when you, you know, if you buy them and you get them, you say, hey, these are not serrated. It's because you have to look really, really close and mm -hmm. kind of, uh, you know, on an angle and you'll see there's a very fine serrated edge on them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, these are not your pinking shears. <laughs> these are right. fine yeah. serrated ones. Yeah, that's you know, I got I got mine from Tanya Berlin, and uh, yeah, you can you can barely tell that there's a serration there. I mean, you can see there that right. there's it, there's not a it's not like a pinking shears or anything like that. I mean, it's barely mm -hmm. visible, but you can feel right. it when you cut. You can feel it grab that metal. Right. I, the those scissors that I bought at Nashville from Rainbow Gallery were metallic serrated edge scissors, and they were about twenty five dollars, and they're very nice. Yeah, that so. seems to be about the right price. And I um, I noticed that somebody was asking me about Japanese needles that have a, a bigger eye. Um, so yes, I use Japanese, Japanese needles. Uh, they're sometimes handmade, sometimes hybrid needles. Um, they're very expensive. And uh, in this case, I don't need them because I'm not sewing a metallic thread through my fabric. Uh, I would only use a Japanese thread with a large round eye if I was stitching a, a size number one or size number two Japanese metal thread through the fabric. So uh, for couching, you don't need one of those because I'm just I'm, I'm passing a, a cotton thread in this case through the fabric. Okay, for all uh, all you have never done this who are in my boat. Um, the things I'm learning here as I'm working my way around is, as Natalie showed in her drawing, to come up, I, I'm basically find myself trying to keep a center line underneath uh, with my uh, Guterman thread, uh, with my holding thread, a center line underneath the uh, twist. So I'm trying to keep a center, a straight center line under there and then come up and go down and follow that angle of the twist and I'm getting about 80% success here. But when it when you get the angle right, boy, it just lays right in that twist perfectly. And you can see it. I don't know if it's real visible, but um, yes, I can see. I can see it. It looks good. It yeah. So I start to get a feel after a few stitches. I start to get a feel for um, for that. And then it uh, it also, if you get it right, it really helps you hold a straight line with the twist. Yeah, and I mean, as I said, if you did a few rows of this, Gary, it would become much quicker and um, even better. And what I like about your stitch, Gary, is that it's not too big. Because some people, they make their stitch too big and then you can see it on the white fabric. So I can see that you're coming up from underneath the twist on an angle and going over and inserting back under the twist. Right, that's so what I, I meant. Wanted... Oh, sorry, go on. That's what I meant where I'm trying to keep a center line with the uh, holding thread that's directly underneath the twist. Right. Yeah. Um, so here's an example, Gary, where this is a twist here. This is a number one twist. And mm -hmm. you cannot see my couching stitches. I've used a translucent thread and I've, I've followed the, you know, the grooves or the valleys of, of the twist. So you cannot really see that couching stitch in here. There's a few little ones I can see and I say, oh, I didn't go enough on an angle. Um, but that, you know, that's what you want to aim for. Okay. So shall we move on to another thread? I think type? we should. Yes. That's, um, okay. So that, that's not only is it interesting, but it was starting to be fun because it's a fun challenge to get that to match that twist just right. So that's, yeah, that's great. Okay. 
And I just also wanted to, you know, mention they, as I said, they come in lots of colors, and this is a three ply shiny black one. Um, and I use this stuff a lot, so I buy in in bulk quantity from Benton and Johnson, and it's really quite affordable if you if you buy in in bulk. Uh, particularly if you want to share it with some friends, you know, go in on a whole reel. So do you want to talk about the uh, Rococo and the check thread? Yes, yes. Because that's still in the basic couching family. Right. So let's go with the Rococo and check thread. Yes. Okay. So there's, there's the Rococo. Maybe if you lay the two right beside each other. Yeah, that's, that's where I was. Let's see. Hang on. I'm going to get a, actually get a strand out here. So there's Rococo. And then here's the check thread. So it's a much smaller. Is it always a smaller dimension? So the check thread has a, uh, has a tighter wave than the Rococo. They both have a fiber core, just like the passing and the Japanese thread had. Um, and when you stitch this down, you stitch in the valley. So you would place a stitch here. Yeah, here, let me, here. Cut, off, let me cut off a length first. I'm going to go with the Rococo. Here. Yep. And this again, spirit. this is a thread that you would not start stitching at the very beginning. You always want to leave yourself a good tail that you can sink into the fabric later it, that you can bring to the back of the thread. But the stitch mechanics are similar to the twist. Um, this one, you can go on a slight angle. Oops. Again, no, not. No, um, okay, all right, Natalie, so just a second here. So um, yeah. now what I'm seeing on this uh, Rococo is the uh, the fiber is, the, the, the core fiber is showing through. Can, should I use that? It's, it's in the valley, so it looks like I can. So you almost, have, a, are you saying that there's like a damaged piece where you can see the fiber core? Well, th I guess that was my question. Is that uh, if, if you can see the fiber core, is that good or bad or does it not matter? Well, I guess it depends on how much. If you look really closely at the whole thread, because it's being wrapped on, on a wave, the, the cotton thread was already wavy when they were wrapping it. Yeah. Um, it's difficult for them to get the wrapping side by side. So I'm just unwrapping it here. I don't know if you can see that. So there's my metal that I've taken off. Yeah. And here you can see the fiber core. Lots and lots of pieces of string wrapped together there. By manufacturing this stuff must be a... Pardon me? Manufacturing this stuff must be an experience in itself. Oh, yes. I've been to the factory in the UK where I buy mine from. That's called Benton & Johnson. I went on a, a half-day private tour with Neil and another stitching friend of mine. And he showed us all the machines, how they work, how old they are. It was a fascinating process. And, and they're all handmade, uh, you know, hand inspected, um, run through the, the hands of the, the technicians there. There's only three <laughs> that run the whole factory. Mm. Now, another thing, a tip you gave in a previous show was yeah. as a beginner to consider using Congress cloth as a way of giving you channels to work in. And I have to say, yeah. I, can, I can see how that would be a real advantage, um, a real advantage to learning. Yes, I think Congress cloth um, would be quite nice, it's particularly if you wanted to create a pattern and you wanted the spacing to be dictated by the count of the thread, the thread count of your fabric. Um, you know, in this case, we're just having a play, so it doesn't matter. We're just going randomly. Um, but if you wanted to use that to help you have, 
you know, a very straight brick pattern, for example, or a diaper pattern, um, then that will be uh, quite helpful to you. Yeah. Okay, we have some questions. We don't care, real quick. Um, Patty wants to know, when using the Japanese or passing thread, is it easier to turn a corner with a finer or thinner thread? I'm going to say yes, um, because the thicker the thread is, the more you have to really pinch it together as you go around the corner. Um, and there's a, a variety of ways that you can turn a corner. Um, there's many ways you can turn a corner. And I did do a video on YouTube uh, last week on how to turn a corner uh, the way that I think is the most efficient with a you know four point stitch. Okay. Um, so uh, you know, and also a Japanese thread will will fight you a little bit more in the turn than a passing thread because, as I said before, the passing thread has a metal content. So when you bend it, it holds its shape. Mm -hmm. Okay, then Cynthia Jackson said it's a little easier if you have a line mark to follow. So that's why I have a question with that. When I on the gold piece work piece that I'm doing, it's actually a pencil drawing, and we follow, you know, we fill in or follow the the areas that are dictated. So on your pieces, Natalie, do you have a design, or do you, or is it all free form? Uh, I'll often, actually not often, I always draw my design on my fabric first. I like to use a, a gold gel pen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if I'm doing a diaper pattern, I actually draw a grid on directly on my fabric and I use my, my grid drawing mm -hmm. to help me know where to place my stitch. And that's because I typically am not using counted thread, uh, counted fabric. Mm -hmm. So if you had a counted fabric, you could actually make a geometric pattern by counting over your threads of your fabric. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but if you're going to work on silk or other uncounted fabrics, then you, you need to draw a grid on your fabric. And I always use a archival Micron Sakura 005 pen okay. for drawing on my fabric if I don't use a gel pen. So those are the two things I use only for drawing. All right, then the final question that we have for right now is Tanya Garrison wants to know what is the proper way to anchor the passing thread on the back of the fabric? Okay, right. So that's a whole nother demonstration, but typically there, there are two ways that are typically done. Uh, one would be to create a lasso. Uh, do you know what a lasso is? Do I need to demonstrate what a lasso is? I know what it is, but other people probably okay. would be worth it. So, you know, put two strands of thread. Hang on. I'm going to demonstrate that one, okay? So I've got quite a big needle here. And I'm going to put strand of thread. So I've just folded my strand of thread in half. And I just have a loop. Okay, so I've got my my needle eye and my loop here. And let's say I wanted to bring my thread to the back. Let's say this was the end of my line here. I have quite a big needle to create a good size hole for me. And now I've got my loop. You place the end of the thread you want to finish off into that loop. Now I have quite, I've, I've used quite a thin Guterman thread right now, so it actually might not be strong enough to do this, but I'm just wiggling the thread. Let's see if my Guterman's going to be strong enough to do this. The Rococo's quite thick, this uh, Rococo. No. So, hang on. I'm going to make my hole a bit bigger. I'm just using... You can use a stiletto, an awl, or a tickleberry. And let's try that again. 
And I can also show you the other way. There we go. Okay, so now it's through to the back of the fabric. And then I would turn over my frame and I would fold the, ro the Rococo back on itself and overcast stitch five or six times until it was nice and secure. The other way would be to take the tip of the thread that you want to sink, put it right in the, the eye of your big needle like that. Oh, well, it's getting a bit messy here, but let's say I want to sink it right here. Oh, push that through the fabric. And I just kind of wiggle the needle around. And I pull that through the back as well. And yeah, I would do one at a time. So you see, I've got one and I've got another one here. So now I'll go right beside that and I would do the other one. Okay. And then for the couching thread, how do you anchor that when you start couching? Oh. So the, like my holding thread, this gray one mm -hmm. to finish. So let's say I was finished with the thread then I'm just gonna come up and I'm gonna do a couple little pinhead stitches, which just means a tiny thread over one piece of, one line of thread, your fabric. Do a couple of those. See, I'm hiding it underneath. And then you come up and you snip off. Finished. Okay, Gary, so how's that going on your Rococo? It actually, I, I was starting to enjoy it. <laughs> okay. So, so um, not too much different than the twist. No. So the but main now, difference uh, is just the angle of your couching stitch. Right, So that and that was a question I had. So in, in the case of the Rococo, I should try to do a perpendicular uh, to the thread. Yes, or even a slight angle because the valley is in a little bit of an angle. Okay. Um, but whatever you choose, you need to be consistent because that's when it looks bad is if you're not consistent. Right. Okay. So couching over Japanese thread and passing thread, you want it to be a 90 degree angle over the thread. And couching in the twist, you can, f you, some people couch 90 degrees but it's, it's uh, commonly couched on the angle of the twist itself. Yeah, okay. So I have to decide that. All right, I see it. Yeah, and, and I, can, I can see that uh, I'm not consistent in my angles, and that, yeah, it looks sloppy in a hurry. Well, I mean, that consistency, Gary, is only going to come after, you know, 100 hours of practice. Right. So I just but I want it now, Natalie. I want it right now. Yeah. <laughs> of course you do, like everybody else. Um, I just want to show another interesting thread. This looks like a, a, a Grishin twist because it has, well, this one's um, quite tarnished. This is a vintage thread that I got from Tinsel Trading in, the, in Berkeley. Um, but what's interesting about this one is that it's 100% metal compared to the twists we were talking about earlier. I forgot to show this when we were talking about twists. But this is quite a quite an interesting thread. So in gold work, there's lots and lots of old threads available because it's been around for ages. And I'm just trying to find the end of it to show you, to unravel it. Ah, here. So you can see it looks a lot like the Gresham twist with the two-ply. But then if I unravel it, it's 100% metal. This is and then inside, instead of a fiber core, let me take off a bit more. You can see it's a piece of metal here. So instead of the fiber core, there's a piece of metal, and then they've wrapped another metal thread around it. So it's fun to kind of see what's out there and what matches the look that you're going for. 
So do you want to move on to another family of threads? I do. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about some threads that you would use for a technique called cut work. Okay. So here I get out a velvet board and uh, Gary cleverly told me that you could just take your velvet velvis and turn that into a board. Velvet Elvis, sorry. And turn yeah, that I, into... Yeah, yeah, I taught Natalie something. She didn't know about the uh, famous Elvis paintings on velvet. Um, <laughs> I, I said that's probably about 10 years before me. Yeah, yeah, and that's, yeah, that was when she reverted to making me feel old. Yeah, she, she got right back at me there, and it was... <laughs> so you could take apart that would be make a very nice uh cutting mat anyway so uh, often for this next technique you use a piece of velvet on a piece of card um just to help you cut and not have your threads bounce away so just to kind of make your eyes water a little bit this would be a handful of a type of thread called bright check pearl here's it in gold and in silver and it also comes in other colors and when you see a thread ha having a label of pearl on it it is typically going to mean that it's hollow on the inside so there's bright check pearl there's smooth pearl there's rough pearl and there's pearl pearl all these funny names now Nat um, natalie natalie uh since I'm going to start designing tomorrow, now that I've actually done this, uh, I think I'm oh, ready to move right. right on to designing. If okay. I if I was going to buy large quantities of that, do you buy it by the pound? Do you buy it on a spool or by right. the hank? It, it's or? typically sold by the gram. Okay. So right. um, you get quite a lot when you, you know if you buy 25 grams of this stuff. It's not that heavy. Yes. So okay. So for Example, I bought this one here and it, you know, kind of arrived with the little string on it like this. And this is some uh, smooth pearl that I use on a candy cane design. It's so lovely to take out of its packaging. Anyhow, so this stuff, it gets cut up like a bead. Think of this as bead work. So for all you beaders out there, you'll quite like this. And all you do is you snip it. And now this is be quite a long bead, right? This would be like a bugle bead. Um, for you, Gary, what you can experiment with is some smaller pieces. And once you cut it into a small piece, it's called a chipping. Okay. So this little piece gets put onto your fabric as if it were a bead in its most basic form, okay? There are other fancy things that we can do with it. You know, we can put down some string padding or felt padding first and put hundreds of those little beads everywhere. Um, and we're not going to do that today. Just to give you a feel. So what I like to do when I'm doing cut work is I will cut a whole bunch of this to the size that I need it to. So they're all the same. Particularly if I'm filling in a space, a little space randomly. So this one, you want to make sure your thread is good and waxed um, because it easily catches onto the fabric. So I've got my thread. Now I will often pick up that little piece that I cut, the chipping, onto my needle like this. And if I don't want to handle this very much, kind of reduce the amount of contact that I'm having with my hands on the metal, you could use your Malore to slide it down. So I'm using, I straighten my thread and I just kind of push it down with my Malore. Well, look at that. And then you want to attach it in, in the most basic way to use this is, is to attach it to the fabric at the same length of the chipping piece. Okay, so honestly, think of this as like a bead. Uh, some people they'll double the the double their thread when they're going through to just to make it a bit stronger. I usually do not do that because sometimes I want to be able to take it off, and if your thread is doubled, it's a bit harder to do that. 
Um, you could cut a long piece. So here's a longer piece. Got that on my on my needle, and I'm gonna bring that down again into my fabric using my malore. Now let's say I wanted to do something fancy, and instead of anchoring this piece of right check pearl right here, I could anchor it where I came up and watch what's going to happen. Creates like a little flower loop. Look at that. So that's a, a, a one, one way to create dimension. So have a little play, Gary. See what you come up with. Well, I just did. Here, let me put me back on. I just did one. I wondered how you guys got that stuff to to um, attach. I didn't realize it was hollow in the middle. Yeah. It's, um, it's fun. So you can imagine lots and lots of those little pieces all kind of attached at different angles, uh, how bri brilliantly it would shine. Yes. And... So when you're putting a lot of them together, often the pieces are very, very small. They're cut almost so that it's a square instead of a rectangle. So that gives you an idea of how tiny it would be. And because it's really faceted, this is, is uh, spun onto a triangular shaped needle. Um, because it's so faceted, it really catches the light coming in from all different angles. Oh, and I, I, I cut the first uh, few, I cut right here on my um, ground cloth, and I'll be picking up a couple off of the, off of the carpet after we get done. Yeah, did they spring yeah, they away bounced, on They you? bounced their way right off the top. So then I went over to my uh, beading pad, and they tend to stay where they belong better. Okay. So there's a, there's a lesson learned right there. Okay. Now, all right, now here, okay, how... I want I want to go down. So if I want this to lay flat, I want to go down right at the end of it. So I yes. kind of have to fiddle a little bit. Yep. You, and I see how you're moving it right down to the end of your thread there. Yes. That's good. Because if oh, you don't, okay. then it's going to wiggle around later. There, I see it now. Okay. Well, that's fun to do. Yeah. So this is a, a technique. This is... There's a technique called cut work, which is when you're cutting the metal threads to the exact size that you need it. And in particular, this one is called chipping, which is when you cut very small pieces and you attach them kind of at different angles, all very close together. So here, I'll show you an example of that. Um, again, back to this piece. So you see, I've done that with the blacks here. So this comes as a wire check pearl in this case in black. Here, here. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see because it's black on black, but you can imagine if this was in gold, how how bright it would be. Right. And so some sometimes in in it seems to me like people have spilled filled areas, and it's just a random placing of these things. Yeah, you want them to go on all different angles. Because it looks nicer. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks much nicer because it just catches the all the different lights coming in at different angles. So that's that stuff. Now, as I said, you can put down felt padding, you can put down string padding and thin lines and stretch the stuff over top as as was seen in the candy cane. So that that's the technique that you're using in my candy cane design that we talked about last week. Okay. A quick question. Yeah. Uh, let me see, Cindy Baldwin wants to know, is it important to have your fabric on the straight of the grain? And if so, how do you achieve that? Practice, practice, practice. Uh, yes, okay. it's a it's a good idea. I've, I've been a, ju in a judge in a competition and I saw a piece that was entered. And the design itself was interesting, but I was so distracted by the fabric that was off grain um, in the mounting process and I think also in the initial stitching process that it really uh, it detracted from my eye. 
And, you know, being on the grain, if you're wanting to use your fabric threads as a place to count for pattern work, the diaper patterns, definitely needs to be straight. Mm -hmm. And explain what the grain is. So, for example, uh, when you're looking at the run of the fibers of your ground fabric, the way they run vertically or horizontally, is it straight up? Is it straight or horizontal or on an angle? You don't want it to be on an angle. All right. Then Karen wants to know, do you not every once in a while like you do in beading when you're doing placing these chips? So I wouldn't do a knot. I would just do a pinhead stitch. And some people, they actually do a pinhead stitch after every single piece of cut work that they attach. Because if you do that, then if you need to take off a piece of cut work, then it doesn't unravel all the other ones that you have already attached. Does that make sense? Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like an anchor, anchor stitch between every single stitch, mm -hmm. um, every single placement of the cut work. So yes, we'll do, we'll do it after every few and that way if they damage it later, because it's quite a fragile thread, this one, um, or you say, actually, I just don't like the angle of that one, then you can take it off without having to take off all of them. Mm-hmm. And then just to reiterate, so that I'm everybody knows that what you're cutting with, you're cutting the the metal threads with embroidery scissors that have ser serrated edges and they are made for metallic threads. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay, Gary. Do you okay. want to get on to plate? We have plate to talk about. We yes. have. Uh, Millery, we have spangles, so whatever we don't, we're running out of time. I know that. Yes. Show. What's most important to you? Let's do pearl pearl because I think that uh, the there's a technique in there that was worth showing. Oh, pearl pearl. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okie dokie. Let me get some of that out. That out of the way. So this thread is called pearl pearl. It comes in different sizes and different colors. When you first get it, it's very tightly coiled. So you need to relax it a little bit. And by relaxing, it just means opening the grooves a bit. So let's say this is the about the size of piece that I wanted. I'm gonna snip off what I need. There we go. And I'm gonna relax it ever so slightly by holding the ends in my fingers. And just pulling it apart, tiny bit. And by doing that, I'll be able to get my couching stitch to fit right into the grooves and become okay. invisible. Move, move lower on the screen, Natalie. Uh, other way, other way. There you go. Now you're centered. Okay. Yeah. Here, right. let me turn down the brightness a little bit so people can see that. Now, and it's something I wanted to mention when we uh, were practicing the other day, it was the first time I'd ever relaxed this stuff. And you can see it on the ends. You definitely want to have more than you're going to use because those ends get pinched when you pull it apart. Yeah. So you can see that the end, I'll put this down on the fabric, actually. You know, this end that I was pinching is not stretched because I was holding that. So you would actually cut off that bit. You don't need that bit. And now I'm ready to begin couching it down to my fabric. So again, you wouldn't want to come up on the very first coil. Come up a few coils in. Now you're going to go over the pearl pearl. And you want to kind of insert on an angle. And you want your thread to be, oops, I can't find it in the back now. You want your thread to go into the groove there. Ooh, mine's not cooperating. So if it can't go in, it means that you haven't opened up the thread, the pearl pearl, quite enough. So I'm just gonna open it up a little bit more. Trim off that knotty end. Okay, I'm gonna try that again. 
Oh no, my needle fell off. Oh, it happens to you too. All right. Oh, no, yeah. Better. And I always find it because I don't want my kids to step on it. Horrifying. So I've come up on one side. And you can see that there's kind of an angle yes. to the pearl pearl. And you want your couching stitch just to kind of disappear. It's in there, but you can't see it anymore, right? Hopefully you can't. Right. And you move along a few more. I mean, depending on how, if I'm going on a tight curve, I'm going to place a couching stitch into every valley. So every, wow, that's a lot. So around the corners then, that's when you really tighten down and do, hit every one of them. Yeah, but I mean, I'm going on a straight line here. So I've kind of got one every, every four grooves. And I'm coming up from underneath on an angle. And I'm reinserting on an angle to kind of hide that stitch underneath the pearl pearl. Letting it sit. So you wouldn't leave it sitting on top here like this, okay? Right. That's not good. So sometimes I might have angled my stitch in a way that it's not going to uh, fall into the groove. So I just, instead of pulling hard, because if you pull hard, you'll dent it. Instead of pulling hard, I take it out and I do it again. Okay. You want to have a go, Gary? Yeah, I've been... <laughs> Let me add me back here. So, yeah, that's um, it's pretty neat. Pretty neat. <coughs> sorry, pretty neat the way it just disappears in there. Yeah. So you could. Let me take a bigger piece here. You could really open it up wide like this, okay? And then you could take another thread purple, pink, red, whatever, and you could wrap it around and around and around like this. And that would be called wrapped pearl pearl. And then you can couch it down with another color and it creates a really nice, um, it's, it's a nice way to add some color into your pearl pearl by wrapping it around. And this is uh, pretty smooth stuff, so you don't have to worry about uh, fraying whatever color thread you would wrap around that? No, it's very smooth. Is, is Pearl Pearl what is used in your candy cane? On the outside, I have finished it off with Pearl Pearl. Mm -hmm. And on the inside of the candy cane, I've used Bright Check Pearl and Rough Pearl and Smooth Pearl. So you get you get all four pearls in there. <laughs> <laughs> so and the each of them has their own texture and their own amount of shine maybe many of you have seen this design if you're on two cameras it's very common to use pearl pearl as an outline so on this nail of this shell here i've used pearl pearl it's quite a strong line right and uh, pearl pearl really holds its shape there's no fiber core. Um, it's quite a versatile thread. These without the fiber core seem easier to deal with. Okay. Is that yeah, a fair well, assessment? Well, it's they just they stay where you push them to stay much easier. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Here. Yeah, okay. okay. That's straightforward that's there. That. Yeah, that's, uh, that, yeah, that's... Sometimes you'll even hear a little pop as your thread um, fits in between the grooves of that. And that's what I was experiencing, yes. Okay, yes. great. Terrific. Okay, let's try the plate. It still okay. scares me. Plate, yeah, that's fun. Plate is fun. Okay, so plate. Think of this as a metal ribbon. Okay. It's beautiful. It has so much, it's like a little mirror. It has so much reflective quality. Um, I'm going to snip off a piece here. So 
So to get plate started. Am I still on camera if I'm yes, stitching you are. here? Okay. You're going to be full screen here in just a second. There you go. Okay, so to get started, I take, cut a piece of, of plate that I need. It comes in different sizes as well and different, you can get fancy effects on it. You can get whipped plate and you can get um, a plate that looks like it's corrugated. Uh, anyway, this is like a basic broad plate. So I have, a, I've, I've folded it, I've made a hook. Look at this stuff, if you fold it, it stays. I've made a little hook and I'm going to place plate on the fabric. I've anchored it down. Okay. This is one way to use plate. Okay, there's lots of ways that you can use plate. Um, there's one listener on here, Cynthia Jackson, a Canadian artist, and she uses this in the most incredible ways as cut into thin strips underneath um, couching stitches, patterned work. Anyway, so now it's anchored. You see, after I, I put the plate, I folded it, I put a stitch through, and then I did a little pinhead. That's just to hold it in place. And let's say I want to come this far. I'm going to put a stitch over top of it. And now I fold the plate over. And you can, my stitch is hidden. Uh, often after I fold it, I'll just come here and I'll do a little pinhead stitch again. And I bring it over to the next side. And I think important to note uh, these pinhead stitches, unlike with uh, linen or or other things, you're going into a, essentially a solid fabric. They're very easy to do and they hold immediately. You don't have to yes. do a lot of fiddling with them. No, just up and down, tiny, yep. tiny little stitch, one run right beside the other. So now I've come back to the other side. You can see I have my couching stitch there, and then I fold the plate back over again. So this is kind of like just a basic way to apply the plate. But there's all kinds of fantastic things that you can do. I, I didn't do a pinhead stitch. So did you see the other side was starting to move on me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back and do the pinhead stitch up, down, somewhere very close beside it. So those, okay. those pinhead stitches become a, a real essential control element. Yeah. Just to make sure your stitch didn't go anywhere. So there you go. And I fold it back on itself again. So it's often used in this zigzag format, back and forth to, to fill a little shape going from uh, one side to the other like that. Have a try if you want. Or maybe I can just quickly show the remaining threads that we didn't have time to get yeah, to let's, today. Yeah, uh, let's let's do that because yeah, we've already uh, uh, the the millery thread is of is of interest. Okay, can you see this one? So this thread is is has an interesting construction. Uh, it looks like a really thin overstretched pearl pearl, but it's not. And if you take that one apart, you'll see. So you've got this wire wrapped around a fiber core again. So the fiber core, it looks a lot like a passing thread. Let's see, I'm just unwinding it all so you can see the construction there. So you've got this very hard metal thread, your fiber core that's wrapped around in this kind of gold stuff. And then there's another third thread. Let me see if I can grab it. This one here that's holding this metal thread onto the fiber core. And this one again would just be couched down on your fabric. You hold it down and you couch it. And to sink this one into the back, there's two different ways. You could just simply snip it off 
But what some people will do, and it's very fiddly, is they'll actually unwind it as I was doing and sink the fiber core part of it. But I think that's just getting to be a bit much. <laughs> so that's that's uh, Millery. So and that, of course that looks like, because that looks like it would be difficult to deal with, but actually as I study it now and, and you uh, talk about it, couching that down is really quite simple because there's very yeah. easy channels to find. Absolutely. It's just kind of treat it like pearl pearl. Yeah. And, you know, it has a good metal content, so it'll hold its shape. Mm-hmm. And then we didn't get to talk today, but maybe another time, about flatworm. So this is an example of a rainbow version of it. Here, I'll show it to you on the whole spool. Um, this is not as commonly used. Um, Ooh, here it is in oh, gold. Yeah. So this would be in gold. So this you would just couch down. It just it has a it's 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 flat. And has a slight kind of movement to it. And so it looks a bit like passing, but imagine you've just kind of flattened it down, put it in a press and squashed it down. So that's a fun one. And then there's, of course, the whole lovely array of spangles. And I really adamant to remind people that spangles are not the same thing as sequins. Spangles are expensive. This little sucker here is 50 cents <laughs> oh and a design often has a lot of them on it and they are made by chopping up pearl pearl so imagine this and it's sliced like a donut and then flattened and because of that there is this always kind of c shape with a little groove can you see on the end there mm-hmm they're not perfectly round, and that's because they've been cut and then flattened. Uh, so, you know, they're all slightly different from each other, and they're they're quite heavy. They add a lot of weight to your design as well. And they, they come in different sizes. And here's some vintage gold ones that have a nice patina on them. Um, I'll take these small gold ones out of the bag so you can see the shine of them. So um, those are spangles, and maybe we can do another a mini demonstration sometime on how yes. to uh, attach spangles. What can you do with them? A lot of gold workers, it's their kind of favorite thing to add in. If you remember this design of the snail, I have little spangles mixed in with the watch parts, and I've used spangles for the eyeballs there. Mm. Um, you know, even on here. I've used spangles as the accent at the end of my swirl. So that was a very, very quick romp through the world of <laughs> metal thread em embroidery. Well, thanks so much. See, this this helped me because it, it just gave me enough exposure to uh, at least have an idea what to do with this stuff. That's terrific. A quick question. Is there a book that you recommend, Natalie, to about gold work to learn more? Yeah, there's a lot of them out there on the market, and a couple of ones that have come out in the last year. Um, Allison Cole has a new gold work master class. My, my kind of go-to one is the book by Hazel Everett. It's called Gold Work Techniques, Projects, and Pure Inspiration. Uh, but Allison Cole's one is very, very thorough. Uh, quite good as well, brand new, and uh, Golden Hind just put out one as well this year. So it depends on, you know, what, what kind of photos do you like, um, how much detailed information, do you want a book that's project-based, or do you want one that's technique-based? Um, so yeah, those are a couple to start with, and then there's The New Ideas in Gold Work by Tracy Franklin, which has lots of inspiration in it, particularly if you want some creative ideas. Terrific. Did Terrific. we get all the questions in, Vanna? Um, that's all the questions. Everybody has thanked every, thanked you, Natalie, for for take, spending time with us today and tell, teaching us all about this. Oh, yeah. that's nice. This has been fun. Thanks so much. This was really, really informative. Thank you.
Yep. So, well, if, uh, if I can organize it, we can perhaps do something with uh, Spangle next time or whatever, whatever you're to know. I'm, I'm happy to share my knowledge. Yes. Okay, now, and then, and also part of this, now Natalie is getting an online school started. Oh, yeah, we can go back to, there we go. Uh, Natalie's getting an online school started. Her uh, website is so by hand, S E W by hand dot C A. Dot yeah. com. Both work. Com. I, I've arranged yeah. both dot com and dot C A. So go there, um, and she has a GoFundMe yeah. page started, and uh, the first class starting in September. Is that correct? Yeah, I'll open registration for that in a couple of weeks, and that will be based on my research paper. Um, and I'm going to start making little video clips of bits of information, how to turn a corner, how to attach a spangle, just little kind of size videos for people to yeah. start enjoying now that, now that I'm able to uh, start investing in some better technology as I, as I build the online school. Yep. Okay. So check all of that out. And then, uh, uh, her designs, the snail and some of her other designs are also available. Uh, if you're interested in picking those up, I have the, what is it? The Van Gogh one. What is that called? Oh, yes, it's called Glitter and Go, a, a toot of the starry night. So you know what, Gary? You'll be ready for that now. After this little demo, open it up and have a go. It's yes. all couching. Yes, I'm all over it. At least I feel, I, like I, can, I feel like I can approach it now, so that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you'll be fine. And uh, my kits come with online support as well. Right now it's a free Facebook page. Um, so we can see how other students are approaching it as well and pictures of their work, which is handy. Yeah. Okay, folks, I think we're going to call it right there. Uh, later on today, we'll have uh, Cindy Young from Luhoon Stitches. Uh, the podcast will go up, and then uh, Vaughn and I will be back Wednesday with the podcast and Wednesday night with the quarantine hour. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time. Hope you learned something. I know I did. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Natalie. We really appreciate it. My All pleasure. Right. Bye We're bye. out of here. All right, bye.